afternoon, everyone, including your pets, small children, uh, anybody else you happen to have hiding um, under your desk, whether you be at home or in the office. Um, my name's Sally. I am from the University of Lincoln, from the Centre for Organisational Resilience. I am joined today by lots of fabulous colleagues from across the Midlands region um, who are going to introduce themselves, give a little bit more detail um, about themselves, but I'll just do a quick whiz through. So I've got Kate Wood here, who is the MHPP project manager from Derby University. I've got Dr. Joe, Dr. Femida, Dr. Louise, and Anne Pemberton again Hello. All, all through the session. Hi. Um, and then we've got in the background. Sorry, really I'm on a conference. Oh, sorry. I think that was somebody telling somebody else she was in a call. Oh, Don't worry, Sally. <laughs> perfect. That's all right. Um, and then um, we've got Dr. Kate and Holly Hill in the background somewhere making all the magic happen. Um, the rest of us wouldn't be able to do it without them. So let's get on then. Today's session really is aimed at a collaboration, really, I suppose. it's a We want it to be a, a creative sort of co-created learning space. So we don't confess to have all the ideas. We know that you've got lots of things that maybe you'd like to um, share with the rest of the group. So we're gonna have a couple of breakout sessions as well, hopefully um, to be able to sort of stimulate conversation, but also maybe there's somebody within those breakout sessions that you think, oh, well, I wouldn't mind kind of um, hooking up with them to discover X, Y, and Z as, as you go through your sort of journey. So that's kind of where we're at. We would love for you to leave your comments, your tips, your ideas in the chat. Um, so if you could do that, that would be fantastic. And I think what we're kind of looking at here today then is that sort of transition back to the workplace, back to the workspace. Um, and I guess for me, it's about um, not just, I, I think there's a couple of things. One, people are saying we're gonna go back to work. And I don't know about you guys out there, but I think I've worked harder over the last sort of 18 months and found it really quite tricky to be um, at home and at work. Um, so I, I'm gonna try really carefully not to say we're gonna go back work um but actually what is that transition like going back to the workplace not just for covid but for anybody maybe that's been off from the workplace uh for any period of time um there will be opportunity at the end for q a um so again uh, don't don't feel um that you uh you know you can't add in Add it in the chat. We'll pick them up at, as we go. Or as I know, if one of the particular um, uh, presenters, one of my colleagues, um, is going to be able to pick that up, then uh, then I'll I'll add that into the conversation as we go. Um, I think as well, I'm going to ask Holly to put some uh, links to things in the chat. Um, to start with, if you or somebody you know needs urgent help, Holly's going to put. Uh, some links to MIND and also to Crisis and the, the Samaritans in the chat line. We can't deal here with any specific sort of one-to-one -one, um, issues, but there are so many people out there that can give you help and support. And again, if you want any particular links, then we'll sort those out for you. So, um, Let's move on. I think one of the first things we're going to do then, Holly, is if you can put everybody into um, breakout rooms, that's kind of challenge number one, isn't it? We might get you in there, whether we ever get you back, who knows? Um, and what I think um, would be a great thing to discuss in this sort of just under 10 minutes is... Um, what are the main challenges for you in your organisation or with organisations that you work with that are related to return to the workplace? So what are the main challenges that you're kind of finding at the minute? We're going to have, as I say, just under 10 minutes of, of chat and then we'll come back 
uh, and we'll move on to um, the presenter series. So my colleagues and I will be in and around uh, the breakout rooms, however many Holly um, creates. So are you ready, Holly? The system works, get that, how cool. Welcome back, everyone. So um, I, we don't have time on the session here today to, um, to be able to go through all the sort of challenges and things that, um, that you've discussed. Hopefully it's been useful for you within your individual sort of sessions just to, um, to share those experiences and also to, to hear other people's experiences. Um, I, I mean, for me, I, I know from all of my sort of HR background that quite often when people are, are away from whatever the organisation is that, you know, they feel like they've been forgotten, they're not part of the team. Um, I know in my group there are lots of sort of conversations about that there are so many diverse needs going back into the workplace, how do we manage those? And also really, I suppose the underlying theme is the uncertainty of it all. You know, we're all expected to be super flexible and go with the flow when we're, this is unprecedented and we're all making it up as we go along. But actually that leaves that sort of residual feeling of unease. Um, so we're gonna move on to uh, Dr. Joan, um, who is going to take us through um, in her, some of her ideas and um, sort of some of the things that she thinks are to, to be able to share, enable to, to enable us to start thinking about, all right, so what next on returning to the workplace? Are you ready, Jo? Great. Thank you ever so much. It's lovely to be here and so great to hear um, people really thinking about what, what it is that we need to do to support all those diverse individuals that are coming back with, with diverse concerns. So I'm just gonna spend a very short amount of time. I usually do a whiz bang tour. So um, it will be a whiz bang tour of some of the key issues and talk through some of the research that we've done, particularly in um, supporting people with mental health come back into workplace, but also what learnings can we take from managing any long-term absence or um, gap from being in a, in a workplace context. And I think there are so many things that we can learn and apply to this, this new situation. This little picture that you can see here was something that we developed for a, a project we've been doing with the DWP. And it's really what we hear from managers and employees who are struggling in those, those different voices. So employees thinking, I just don't know, particularly if you're, if you're struggling with your mental health, I don't know what I'm feeling, I don't know what this is, I'm, I'm feeling overwhelmed and possibly feeling lots of new feelings that, um, that have never come up before. And I know certainly from the work that we can see across the pandemic, um, from places like Mind, from, from large national surveys, is that increased numbers of people have experienced mental health, but also people who've, um, who've never had a concern before have felt unsettled. And so lots of new feelings and thoughts that impact the way that we're working and the way that we're approaching going back into work. And from a manager's perspective, um, just, just talking in our group there, the, the load on the manager, having to try and anticipate what is needed and, and, and what to do for the best. So what we know from before the pandemic is that we had too many people struggling to get back to work. Um, one in three fit notes was for mental health, but also many people who return to work already struggle. So we've now got this situation where all those individuals are likely to still find it difficult, but we've now got whole populations that are going to have to think about working differently, whether that's coming back into a workplace or being in a workplace with more people coming in. Um, and this is a really significant issue if we don't manage it properly. What we do know is that often people are off for too long. So the longer people are off, the less likely they're, return, they're able to return. So if we can support them to come back in some capacity early, then that's really great. So we need to think about how we encourage those conversations. If we know somebody who's really apprehensive about doing that commute, see if you can meet them for coffee nearby, see if you can nudge them towards coming back into the workplace. But we also know that managers don't know what to do. They're unsure of what to say. And it's really hard to make adjustments because we feel like it's really complicated. But actually, 
having a conversation about I'm really worried about the commute or I'm you know I'm used to concentrating nice and quietly in my home now and I'm worried about the busy open plan office or what that means for me the conversation can start to help you identify what those adjustments are and employees really often don't feel empowered so if we as um, HR practitioners as, as health practitioners as managers can open up that conversation and say we don't know what's going to happen for the best but how can we help you what are your concerns then it can empower those employees to to say what they want to say and there's this picture of the escalator with no stairs which is what I often feel when people are describing their struggles they know where they want to get to but there's just no clear steps to get there so you've got to kind of claw your own way up and it's such an unfortunate position because when you're feeling vulnerable when you're feeling quite exhausted but you want to make a change we really need those steps to be really, really, really clear. And so whatever we can do to make that clear, but allow flexibility is important. So our key things that we would always suggest, and this comes from looking at, at research across um, across different, different projects, is thinking about connecting really early. So thinking really early about what, um, what we might need and, and what we might need to put in place. So if you haven't reached out, I was just, um, just hearing from Sarah that she had a friend that's waiting for her manager to contact her. So she knows what she'd like, but she's waiting for the manager to ask. But actually we need to talk early because we could both be working to completely different timescales, different ideas of what's gonna work and talking <laughs> and really can help us explore all of those differences and come find, try and find a middle ground. We also want to prepare and plan both as employees and managers. So thinking through what, what bits of our job are we doing really well at home? Which bits of our job are we doing disastrously at home and we need to start, start connecting and having conversations? Which bit of the home, the home environment are we liking? Are we liking that we make our own lunch? Are we enjoying that we can go for a walk? How do we keep those things in without the compromises um, entirely? And then making sure we've got a return to work conversation. So having a conversation that's really structured so that the employee and the employer know what's gonna happen in that conversation and that the line manager is equipped to do it. And I think the key thing here, and this is whether it's somebody coming back after illness, whether it's somebody coming out back after maternity leave, whether it's going back into the workplace when you've been working brilliantly at home, um, or if you've been experiencing long COVID, the same rule applies. It's really hard to dump in day one back at 100%. And I just am feeling so much for those um, really fantastic individuals that are serving us pints and working in retail where they're standing on their feet all day having been on furlough for months and it's really tough to go back to 100% and if we do that we're often going to set ourselves up to a fall so we need to make sure that we gradually prepare people for full-time office work if that's what we're going to do or full-time on-site work if that's what we're going to do um, and those of us that are working in, in service sector, thinking about actually if we've now, now got everyone back in, can we factor, factor in some breaks to help them restore their musculoskeletal system as well as, as, as recuperate from this big shock of going back in at 100%. And then we need to monitor and review. So making sure that we constantly look at what's working and reinvent the wheel. Um, we're really encouraging organizations to take a pause um, and do what you would do if you were a, an astronaut coming back from space or a, an Arctic explorer. And there's a, a lady in New Zealand who works with these professionals who have extraordinary jobs and are often quite isolated. And what she suggests works best for their own mental health and also their productivity later is if you take a pause and don't jump to make decisions in that first month or two, you're much better prepared to su sustain and thrive later on. So if we use this time now to recuperate, to think about what works, to try and test and learn rather than make really clear plans that we need to stick to even if they don't turn out to work, um, then that's what's important. So monitoring and reviewing. And then expecting everybody to have a completely different journey. So we're gonna to have to be really kind and patient. What we thought might happen is unlikely to happen for everybody. Um, the individual that we thought would return really successfully without a fuss is 
possibly going to be the person that finds it the most challenging. So everybody's journey is different and we just need to be really kind and patient. And so I wanted just to share um, a little bit of a, a model with you really to help think through what might be useful. And I'm conscious of, of time, so I'm going to whiz through. But this is the igloo model that, that we've developed for returning to work and also adapted for sustaining our mental health at work. Um, developed with Karina Nielsen and also um, Dr. Femme de Meneer, who you'll hear from in a, in a minute. But what we're, all, what we're doing here is looking at a whole system approach to employee wellbeing and return. So usually when we think about return, it's about you as an individual going back into work, possibly being supported by your manager. What we hear from many stories is unfortunately managers fall short because of time, because of skill, because of lack of awareness of their role. But what we wanted to do was show that actually everybody plays a part. And so we interviewed people returning over time um, a fantastic opportunity to collect lots of stories about what works and what didn't. And so really privileged to hear those. And what we found was at the individual level, we needed individuals to prioritize their self-care and keep those clear boundaries. I don't know about you, but I find working from home, I have terrible boundaries and I really should know better. So I have to work really hard at that. Um, but then creating structure in your working day and prioritizing those urgent tasks is absolutely key it sounds really simple, but so few of us do these things, but these are the things that really sustain a, ret a healthy return to work when we're thinking about that transition, giving people the best opportunity to transfer. To transfer. Mm -hmm. The next area is the group level. And this is where we're suggesting that we want to reach out our social contacts, our colleagues are our glue and getting feedback from others, making sure that we get help when there's challenging tasks is really key. And what we've heard through the pandemic is that teams have stopped necessarily reaching out to ask if anyone needs help because you're in different environments, you're working in different ways, you've got social distancing concerns. And so we really need to bed that back in and make sure we give people um, that offer of help and feedback on when things are going well, what worked, rather than all oh, that was a good job, what exactly was it so that we can build our self-esteem and build forward. And then line manager support. So giving your employees the autonomy to do work the way that they feel is going to work best. Ensuring that they've got support and ongoing adjustments if that's needed to working hours, to, to physical environment. Um, and also sometimes having to buffer against inflexible systems. So um, I've heard a lot of people thinking about revisiting their absence management policies, revisiting their flexible work policies. And if you work in HR, absolutely please do do, do that. We're just, um, we've just created some guidance for the CIPD that's going to be coming out for their absence management guidance. And one of the key things that, that we've suggested on there is to revisit your current practices because they're generally built for organizations about 20 years ago. And so thinking about how we manage fluctuating conditions, thinking about how we manage diverse needs on an individual basis is absolutely key. And then at the organizational level, we want those flexible practices and to really try and embed that culture of mental health um, and awareness. And so you've got this parity between mental health and physical health, and it's no easy thing to do. And I know Louise is going to talk about the manager's role in that in a second. And so we've got lots of little um, pieces of guidance that you can use if you're interested in looking, but all of those things really tap into um, key areas that we can support the individual. And if you're a manager, you can think about, okay, what am I doing to support my individual in these different ways? Am I helping the team look after each other? Am I aware of what those those organizational policies are so that I can make sure that they're put into place. Um, if you're an individual, you can look out and see where your gaps in your igloo are. And if you're an HR practitioner or a business owner, you can then think, okay, have I got all of these pieces in place and do I support individuals in that way? And so the igloo approach really helps to embed that principle of working together and making sure that everybody has got a role to play um, that returning individuals know what they should be doing, but also they know they're not on their own, um, that teams can work together 
that we have line managers that are skilled and confident in what they're doing and organizational professionals having the right policies and practices in place. So we do know that a lot of this is gonna fall on line managers and we really need our line managers to have knowledge and skills and confidence to support that. But also to do that, we need to have research that really helps us understand what's working for whom. We mentioned that there's so many different people returning to work with different needs. Um, and I think understanding what's going to work for different types of people is gonna be key in helping us unlock some of the challenges that, that we've got, got ahead. So really just a, a whiz bang tour of some of the key things that we can put in place and there's um, free to use guidance and, and so on, but also um, the reason behind, behind this webinar is to connect you to some really great research opportunities and, and um, areas that can help to embed some of these practices as well. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, if you're all right, Jay, we'll share some of that content after the event so all participants ha have access and also being able to, um, you know, to get in touch with, with you through your contacts. I thought it was, I, I love the idea of the igloo and all the sort of layers on top of each other and, and the power of opening up that conversation to, to understand that life isn't linear everybody doesn't start in the same place and end up in the same place and go through this journey. So actually that sort of flexibility. And I guess one of the challenges for us now is what does that workplace look like? Are we going to have people who are back in the workplace or are they going to be working from home some days and, and in the office space some days, you know, they could be working from their luxury yacht or, you know, where, wherever. And I, and I guess that's like the, the idea then that you're talking about is having the policies, but actually putting those policies into practice, making sure that we do those things. So we're delighted to have Anne Pemberton with us from Open Road Learning. Anne's going to take us through some ideas really um, from her perspective as a practitioner around culture, about leading teams, about how do we bring teams together really so that we've got an opportunity um, to sort of reflect and think, oh, I, you know, I might steal that idea from us. So um, Anne, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. So I'm just checking. Can we all see the screen okay there? Is that all good? Good. Yep. Thanks, Sally. Lovely. Thank you. So yeah, so I guess um, in my role as a sort of a, a training consultant, though I really don't like that word, but anyway, helping organisations to, uh, to get best performance. Um, it's we've been spending quite a bit of time with several of our clients now just really exploring what we mean by this well being agenda. And just to give you a feel for this, this is um, some work put together by Professor Derek Mowbray of the Resilience Training Company. So he's a leading academic in this area um, and I was fortunate to be trained by him. And he talks about this wellbeing agenda where we're aiming for this peak performance and productivity. And we know that in order to do that, we have got to have individuals that are well, so physically, emotionally and mentally well. So in order for us to achieve this, you can see, firstly, we need resilient and adaptable individuals. And we know people have taken a real hit over the last sort of 14 months or so and I think one of the things we need to be aware of is that you know there is work to be done about how we do support people some of the things that Joe was talking about in her presentation there so so we do need to be looking at resilient and adaptable individuals but I want us to focus on this bit up here particularly around this area of culture so Professor Mowbray talks about us having these positive events or behaviors so we need to have some positive leadership behaviors and I'll touch on those in a moment we need to have this positive environment. And again, lots of dialogue already starting today about what does that actually look like as we move forward? And I think it is gonna be how we, we merge things together from getting the best bits of homework into the best bits of being back in the office as well. But I'm not gonna go into that today because I want us to talk about this thing called culture because it's such a key part to how, how we enable people to perform at their best. So, if we look at sort of the elements of culture, um, and we're working with organizations at the moment at the top level to look at organizational culture, but also encouraging their individual teams to think about 
what is the culture within this team? Because we could have a really positive organisational culture, but some pockets where actually those those actions don't result in the things that happen at that team level. So really working with teams, um, team leaders and team members, I think that's crucial as well to have this inclusivity, um, to think about what it means. So getting them to describe what would be a psychologically unhealthy culture. So things like fear, blame, backstabbing, just overwork work, this uncaring, dismissive, even things to people saying the work hard, play hard mentality doesn't sit any anymore with with well being, you know, that's not what it's about. So then starting to think about so what does a healthy team culture look like? So again, words that often get used would be open, supportive, appreciative, a good balance, and productive challenge. So, you know, we talk about, you know, people still need a challenge to perform at their best, but how do we do that in a healthy and productive way? So we sort of break that down into some specific areas. So really identifying things like, so what are the rules within this team? And they could be spoken rules or even unspoken rules. So things like email etiquette, you know, do we, do we turn up for meetings on time? Do we finish on time? Do we have a purpose? Um, and what's been interesting in the discussions is as people move back potentially into the workplace, are we just going to go back to the old ways of doing things or have the rules changed now? And I think one of the interesting things to think about is what do we take? How do we take the best bits of what we've learned over the last 14 months and really bring that into creating a new way of working and a new culture? So things like rules, you know, clear about team purpose and has our team purpose changed now as a result of what's happened over the last 14 months? And, you know, what really are our shared values? Because I think people's sort of values at work, if you like, I think have changed. I think people have really refocused on what's most important to them. So I think that's a, a really powerful conversation to have. And also thinking about the vision. So, you know, where are we actually going and how does that fit with everybody's individual visions? And I think that's something that doesn't always get brought up in the workplace. You know, why are we at work and what are we looking to achieve from that? And how, how does that fit with that overall company and team vision? And linking into that, the strategy, how do we do that? And um, one of the things Joe mentioned there a little bit as well within teams is about partnerships and relationships with other teams or with your other stakeholders or supply chains. And what a lot of companies have started to say to us is they've actually probably got stronger relationships within their teams, but have absolutely not got such strong relationships with other teams now. So people almost going back to some silo working, I think, just because we've got really good at protecting what's important to us. And maybe maybe that's to do with the environment where we're not interacting as much with other teams and we've just lost some of that partnership there. So, again, thinking about that as part of the culture, how do we reestablish that? How do we make that new or how do we make that different? And problem solving as well. And again, I think we've potentially found some new ways to do better problem solving, maybe more efficient um, as a result of different styles of working. So it's absolutely, I think for me, a great opportunity to really redefine culture so that we absolutely take the best of what we've learned um, and bring that into some new ways of working. Um, but recognising it's a big challenge as well, and it's it's got to be done in a way that people are included, so that people do feel they're contributing to this. Um, so I would encourage any of you to, you know, just encourage your teams, your colleagues to just get together and have that conversation. You know, what is our culture? What's important to us? How do we want this to work? Um, so that we can really think about that going forward and help to support wellbeing. And linking into that, Joe's right, and I always feel really bad that we keep asking managers and leaders to do more and more and more. But I think it's with the belief that actually, if we can get some of this right, it's going to help them in the longer term. So we're going to have more productive teams, we're going to have more empowered teams, which is always a really positive thing. And just giving us uh, this opportunity to create the future. So absolutely encouraging leaders to share responsibility for success. I think, as I say, it can often f sit quite heavily on managers' shoulders saying, well, don't you don't have to carry all of this burden. So get the team involved, get the team to create more of their purpose, get them setting goals and objectives and don't feel that it's down to you to do all of that as well. 
I think interestingly, it's about, you know, and this links into a very much a coaching mentality, which is just, you know, encourage people to think independently. You know, people have done amazing things. So let's just encourage them and reward some of that independent thinking, giving them that encouragement to think through things for themselves and making sure that we're fully valuing and encouraging different thoughts and contributions. So, you know, your team meetings, make sure you have those one to ones. And I think it's this bit about the non-judgmental listening, which is one of my key favorite topics to talk about. So let's just really just properly listen and not just listening to the words, but let's listen to the body language as well. And let's listen for the things that people aren't telling us, you know, not just what they are telling us. So lots of open, not leading questions. Um, an example of this, a client asked me a few weeks ago to just look over some um, employee engagement survey questions they were gonna put out. And the question was, are you looking forward to coming back to work? Yes or no? And I'm like, that's not actually going to tell you very much, is it? So we just very quickly changed that to how are you feeling about coming back to work? Gave people some options from absolutely excited, ecstatic to terrified and a range of words in between, plus some free form text as well. And the wealth and the range of answers we got back was immense and I'm thinking yeah you wouldn't have got that from a are you excited about coming back to work question so just be really mindful of those types of things and how we're, we're putting those things across and I think just remind people that we're all in this together and you're human just because you might have the job of leader or manager doesn't mean that stops you from having your own fears your own hopes your own anxieties so be willing to share that um, I often use the work of um, David Green around the trustworthiness equation which talks about you know to be trustworthy we need to be credible reliable and show a level of intimacy um, and that's for me this is about this bit here let's not be frightened to share how we feel about these things and just share that level of intimacy with others so create this environment so it's again this balance balance between support and challenge so you know if we want people to work at their best we want to encourage that but it is important let's let's make sure we get enough of that enough of each of those things to make sure people can do that and just I think we've, we saw I think well for me personally I saw a lot more of this in the early stages of lockdown this we're all in this together um, and I'm not feeling or seeing that as much with um, organisations at the moment. I think that's something we can definitely take from the earlier days and, and continue with that and bring more of that into, into the workplace as well. So, you know, encouraging team activities. I will put a word of caution out there, uh, this thing called compulsory fun that some of you might be aware of. So just be conscious of that and, and having a breadth and a range of activities that are going to suit the different personalities in your teams and the different situations that people are finding them in as well. So to just be aware of that, but yeah, encourage that interaction, but that, that team spirit. Um, and don't be frightened to tackle those issues, the things that might get swept under the carpet. Um, I think I mentioned you, I'm a mental health first aid instructor as well. And this is one of the things that we, we talk a lot about is, you know, if there are issues there, let's not just skirt over it on the basis that it's not a problem right now. Let's just be have some open and honest and genuine conversation. So, you know, let's tackle the controversial issues. Let's tackle some of the behaviours that might be causing concern, you know, and let's have the skills to do those carefully and sensitively. But let's just not park things under the the, the carpet else they have a habit of coming back to bite us a lot later on as well and we are going to constantly evolve so let's encourage that you know let's adapt and let's promote continuous learning you know some of the teams I work with have a, a weekly lessons learned again that's been really helpful for them and let's also talk about what hasn't worked this week what do we need to change next time and share that share that across your organization so don't just keep it into your team get that out there and a big one for me at the bottom here is uh, my favorite phrase, which is you can't pour from an empty cup. So if you want to be there to support others, we do have this responsibility to, to look after our own well-being as well as that of the other people in our team. I've been working with um, some groups within the NHS recently, some work that um, Kate shared with me and, and they're amazing. But yeah, the, their biggest thing there is they're so busy looking after everybody else, they're not looking after themselves. So we've had some brilliant conversations around that just small things they can do to look after themselves 
And I guess the so what bit at the end. So I wish I could give you a tick list of all the things to do to, to get everybody back to work and everybody to the workplace. So in all happy and helpful and full of energy, but it is going to be challenging. It's going to be so individual. But, you know, just think about some of the things we've talked about there. So, you know, enabling others to share their hopes and fears for return to the workplace and doing that in a really non-judgmental way. Um, other organisations I'm working with have set up some wellbeing spaces so that people, you know, just can take a breather. They've got somewhere to go. They're also training more mental health first aiders or providing um, mental health awareness for line managers. So just that people feel confident to have those good quality conversations. Um, one of the things as well, we know that anxiety is on the increase and I would just encourage organisations to really think about the safety measures they're putting in place and to keep doing that. And my example of that is um, because I was looking after elderly parents, I shielded for quite a long time. So I think the first time I went out, I went to Marks and Spencers and it was brilliant because there was somebody on the door, there was somebody with sanitizer. I felt really safe in that environment. And yet when I went there not that long ago, a couple of months ago, a lot of that had all just sort of dipped away you know it was just a bit of a help yourself jobby and I think it's going to be important that we keep those measures up for people who particularly are feeling anxious so don't let your standards slip around that that's going to be important for people and um, just encourage social interaction and I think focus on people's outputs not just visibility again I'm seeing lots of organizations saying they want people back in work because they can keep a better check on what they're doing actually we know everybody worked really hard um, so yeah just focus on the output and just keep reviewing things keep giving feedback and keep giving that positive encouragement I think all just some small things that we can do but if we think about marginal gains if we keep doing enough of the little stuff it'll end up being the big stuff so that's it for me. So I hope that was helpful. And again, happy to share the information after Sally as well. So that's lovely. Thank you, Anne. And again, just that reiteration for me of constant review, checking the policies and checking that we're actually doing what we say we should be doing, because that's, you know, how we know we're going to get that sort of cultural um, sort of buy in. Um, you talked about the elephant in the room. And again, I think a lot of us find that quite difficult. I was listening to a great podcast. I'll, I'll share a link uh, called Work Joy um, podcast. And somebody on there the other day was talking about the elephant, but tackling it with a spoon. So actually, it might be too big just to, to sort of deal with straight in there. So grab a spoon and, and start going. And I think that, you know, again, is the little things that will make, as you say, the, the sort of biggest difference. And, and again, I love, absolutely love this idea of co-creating what the future looks like. None of us really know. So celebrate the fact that we don't know, but allow people to have their voice. And you and Joe both said that to contribute to that discussion. And really importantly for me is about what healthy organisations look for. Let's get rid of the days when we used to put a plaster over something that was broken and let's create how we're going to move forward in a positive way. And I think for me, one of the key things that we can do as a collective, those on this call and, and maybe within your network, is actually have an input into that research because as Joe pointed out, the more the, the more participants in research we have, the better understanding we have of what actually makes a great workplace. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Femida, who's going to talk about uh, one of the pilot um, program, research programmes that we've got going on at the moment called ProWork. Over to you, Femida. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen with everyone. Can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be talking about pro work, which is one of the um, research into pilot interventions as part of the mental health and productivity pilots, which some of you may know is a, a really large um, collaboration between universities and, and some um, businesses and charities such as Mind. And it's about targeting the Midlands and uh, working with businesses and employers to improve mental health outcomes for 
employees in lots of different ways. So this particular um, work package that I'm kind of running is focusing on the return, sick, sick leave and return to work element of people um, in workplaces. It's a, it's not particularly aimed at any one condition. So it's, it's if anybody goes off with mental health or musculoskeletal disorders or any other condition where they're likely to experience um, low mental health as a result of being off and, and managing that, that reason for sick leave. And what we've done is designed a three-step online toolkits and we've got one for employees to use and one for, one for line managers to use and they mirror each other. And the toolkits are designed using all the evidence that both Joe Yark has been speaking about and Anne Pemberton speaking about in terms of communication, keeping those lines open, providing support, et cetera. Um, and the toolkits can be accessed by employees or employers uh, online, by a computer or even on their phone. So we've, we've made sure that it's, it's quite accessible via small screen. So why are we doing this? So um, my colleagues have mentioned already about the, the impact of COVID pandemic and uh, coming back to work. But we also know that there's many people who are going to be quite anxious about coming to work and they'll probably come into work and get very stressed out or anxious about the pandemic, about um, coming back to work and working again in a way that probably wasn't conducive to their health as working from home has been. Um, and they may go off on sick leave again. Although I do appreciate there'll be some people coming back to work and who will really flourish being back in, in a physical work environment. But we know that sickness absence itself does cost about nine billion per year. And that figure is mainly driven by stress and mental health, but it will also now be driven by people who are experiencing, um, for example, COVID and low, long COVID symptoms. And we know that that's, that's um, quite a chunk of, of people who've had COVID will be experiencing long COVID. And we at the moment don't know how that's going to impact work, but what we do know is that people will be taking time off. We know that the evidence shows that providing really good support um, to people who are off on long-term sick leave in two particular ways. One is by working with them about on their cognitive thinking around work, ensuring that they're healthy, so they are uh, taking the time to exercise, to have a good diet, but also working with them to kind of knock down or address any barriers they may have about coming back to work. So that's the cognitive thinking aspect of it. And the second st strand is around good quality communication and regular contact with the workplace. And that's what the evidence suggests is that the two combined are kind of enabling the employee with some uh, problem solving techniques and cognitive thinking techniques alongside really good communication makes all the difference to them coming back. So what our toolkits do is um, it's a series of activities that employees can do in their own time that gets them to to kind of do um, some work around, you know, what is it about returning to work that they're looking forward to, what sort of things need to be resolved before they can come back and, and being really pragmatic about those things. Lots of checklists for in, uh, line managers to record the process that they're doing with the employees, so tick lists and things to reduce the load on, on line managers, but again, making sure that everyone is on the same same board and everyone's doing things at, in, the, in the same way, so to speak. So as part of our work, we have been looking at uh, organizations, return to work policies and practices, and it's amazing how a, a lot of them either don't have um, reporting processes in place to kind of pick up these differences or their return to work kind of process and guidelines are either far too much for a line manager to kind of get get to grips with so it's lots of words or there's just not enough direction so um, a line manager feels reassured as to what they're doing and so these toolkits uh, enable to bridge both those gaps a they're not wordy or lengthy but b they're really clear and provide a step by step guides to line managers and to employees. So what we're looking for is uh, businesses and or councils and schools, et cetera, to take part in our study. And because it's a research study, we will randomize organizations um, into an intervention group and the intervention group will get a access to our online toolkits to use um, for people who go off on long-term sick leave. Um, the employee will get three uh, 
coaching sessions to um, support them whilst they're off and when they're back at work. And at the end of the study, the organisation taking part will get a, a detailed report on, on what we found and how effective these toolkits are. If you're in the control group, you don't get access to the toolkit straight away. But what we do do is we um, do kind of do some surveys with people off on sick leave and with your line managers. Um, we look at your processes and outcomes and we then write a report that's tailored to you in particular on how you can kind of improve um, aspects of your return to work process for your line managers and for your employees. And then at the end of the study, we will give you all access to our toolkits as hard copies and the line manager training. So that's something I forgot to mention is that the line manager does get a, a little bit of an online training that um, kind of explains the purposes of the study and um, how to communicate with employees in particular. If this is something that you're interested in as an organisation, um, please do get in touch, but we also have um, some information about who's taking part so far. So we've got seven organisations signed up and we'd love to kind of hit uh, 10 organisations. We've got a mixture of large, medium and small um, across the East Midlands. Um, we've got a council, we've got school academies and we also have some private companies taking part as well. Um, if taking part in a return to work uh, intervention is probably a bit too much at the moment for you, we're also interested in, in talking to HR um, and people who work in, in that field, so operational staff, operational managers, etc., about um, what you do at, in your workplace, what's your workplace return to work and sickness absence um, process like, and what is it that you'd really like to see the government do with regards to supporting um, return to work um, policy, uh, but also research, what could we do in, in, to help, help organisations overall improve that for them. So if you are interested in either taking part in the, in the pilot study that we're doing, um, please contact Kate Godfrey. And if you're interested in the, doing the interviews, they're only an hour long um, and that's the only commitment, um, please also contact Kate. Or if you're interested in doing both, please contact Kate. Okay, thank you. We'll put Kate's details again in the in the chat. So um, Femida obviously always says Kate, and I always say if you want anything, go to Holly. So uh, that's why they're behind the scenes making all this actually work. Thank you so much, Femida. And I think again, that's sort of my my challenge to all of you is you're all here because you want to make a difference, whether that's to your organisation or to the wider community. So if you can please either share this with um, across your networks or whether or not we can you know get involved with your organizations be part of that research be part of shaping the positive future so that we can help to uh, other organizations who aren't here who aren't quite as proactive but we can get them involved and hopefully their employees will also benefit from the work so thanks again femida um, we're going to move on now. Um, there is a question in the chat from Liz, which um, I know there's some other bits and pieces. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. We're going to move on um, to uh, to talk to Kate and Dr. Louise, who are going to look at um, sort of looking after ourselves, I suppose. Uh, you know, Anne's point about we can't um, fill from an empty cup, um, but also some of the support um, services and, and some of the signposts um, places that you might want to visit after the session. So I'll hand over to you two. Okay, Sally, give me a, a yes if you can see those slides. <laughs> Not the minute. Not the minute. Fabulous. Fabulous. There's a bit of a delay my end. I've had a bit of um, an issue with PowerPoint this morning. Let me see if that is any better. Is that sharing at all? Not yet. Oh, crikey, there's all the best laid plans. Let me just come out of it. Here we go. Not a problem. Here we are. Bingo. Third time lucky. And please excuse the uh, hoover in the background if you hear it, because my other half has decided he's going to decorate today. And I'm telling myself it's part of his self care, so I'm just going with it. Um, bless his heart. And puppy sitting, so it could go very wrong. 
Okay, so we've heard all about how leaders and team leaders um, we, we place a lot of responsibility on, on them as uh, our employers to, to, to look after stuff. But there's a tremendous amount that we can do ourselves. And the issue of self-care has been, it, it's used a lot, isn't it? But I think it's always good to sort of stop and think what that actually means. Um, and I'm just as guilty as probably a lot of you in that we don't always look after ourselves the best that we can. And as um, one of the speakers just said, we can't pour from an empty cup. So it's really, really important. And what is important as well is that we don't need to wait until we're struggling to then start looking at our mental health. There's lots and lots of things that we can do to protect our mental health. Um, now, um, when things seem to be going absolutely fine, um, and I'm going to introduce you to a few of those things, some are really, really simple and you probably already do, but it's always worth, I think, having a bit of a check in with yourself. So what is self care? I always see this as looking after yourself as you would do a friend. And it's yeah, the, the actual definition is the practice of consciously doing things that preserve or improve our mental health or physical health. And it's important to note that just like physical health, mental health can go up and down. And it's really important to do a regular check-in. Um, it's really important to be, to, to look after ourselves so that we're happy, healthy, and we can function in the best possible way. It doesn't have to involve a huge time commitment. It doesn't have to involve loads of money by signing up to the most expensive gym going. It, it can literally be the slightest little thing. And there's some really small things that I know myself I've, I've put in place and they've really had a massive, massive difference. Um, we've referred back to the first um, lockdown and I think everybody was, we're in this together. Um, we were all, put, we saw it was a bit of a novelty. We saw the pictures on Facebook of everybody setting out their, their homeschooling room and feeling very impressed and proud of themselves. And then we had that glorious weather, didn't we, last year? This last lockdown, perhaps not so cheery. Um, January is never the best month. And I think that is what has really sort of dampened people's spirits now. Um, so I think really regularly checking in with ourselves is it, it, just crucial. And these are sort of the benefits of self-care. So it improves our physical health. If we are looking after ourselves and eating regularly and eating a healthy diet, getting outside and doing some exercise and we're allowed more than an hour now, thanks to, to Boris lifting those restrictions. It's so, so important. And I don't know whether anybody else noticed that when we were only allowed an hour, everybody was out taking that hour, but actually it's instilled some really, really good habits in us. It also reduces stress and anxiety. So if you're regularly checking in with yourself, if you're doing activities to help you relax, to help you take some time away, you're moving away from your laptop, you're actually moving away from the screen to have a proper lunch and a proper break, that is only going to reduce your stress and anxiety and you're going to be able to function better in the workplace. The same applies if you return to the workplace. Obviously, that's going to look very different for everybody. A lot of places we were having, you know, we were talking in our discussion group at the beginning uh, are adopting that hybrid way of working. And so what we need to make sure we're factoring in as well are those breaks, those regular breaks and those times where we can just move away from the screen, relax and take some time out. It also helps to boost our self-esteem. So as well as helping calm your nerves, if you're having a particularly difficult day, um, it, it's treating yourself with kindness. So a lot of studies have found that people with higher self-esteem find it easier to deal with setbacks. So if we are looking after our own mental health, that's one of the huge benefits. Anything that crops up, we'll be able to deal with it and we'll feel you know, raring to go with such challenges. The big one as well protects our mental health. And there is a tremendous amount of change that's happened over the last 12, 13 months. And we are being expected now to transition back to the workplace in some form. That is all going to have an impact on our mental health. Anybody that says that they've not been affected by the last 12 months, I, I would imagine is, is, is lying or not being truthful with themselves because we've all had to adapt and nobody likes change or not too much change anyway. So protecting your mental health is crucial. 
and we get better relationships as well. So we're not actually biting our other half's head off um, at the end of the day if we are looking after ourselves and um, making sure we're taking that time out for ourselves. Like I said at the beginning in my definition, it is really about treating ourselves as we would do a friend. And self-compassion, you might see that word and think, oh no, this is a real sort of hippy-dippy word or phrase, or, but it is so, so important. It's about treating yourself how you would treat others. Is this right for me right now? You know, recognize how you're feeling, acknowledge how you're feeling, and sort of acknowledge that that's actually a normal reaction. You're allowed to feel upset. You're allowed to feel negative. So don't beat yourself up if you are struggling one day or, or more. So it's all about being aware of your emotions, about your, your, your physical, your emotional or mental pain. It's about being kind, so treating ourselves with kindness. And it's that common humanity. So really recognising that um, our experiences, they're not necessarily the same as everybody else's, but we can we can all support each other. And I think it was that phrase of, we're not all in the same boat, but we're in, we're in very, very different boats navigating the same storm. And I think that's a really useful analogy. Um, so don't feel bad if you're feeling down one day or feeling stressed one day, just because the other person sitting next to you in the office or at home is, is not feeling so stressed. We all deal with things very, very differently and that's absolutely okay. So six quick ways to be kinder to your body and mind. Set yourself some self-care goals. And it might seem really trivial, and but I do like a, a to-do list. Set yourself a little list of things you want to achieve for yourself, something that you're going to look forward to. Set a date with yourself, as you would do in Teams or Zoom with anybody else in your workplace. Set a meeting with yourself. List what you'd like to achieve that week and have the satisfaction of ticking it off. Um, acknowledge those positive things. So one thing that I've started um, doing is sort of keeping a gratitude journal. So every night I sit there, reflect on the day and think of those positives that have happened. And that's actually come, come out of um, a survey I did around work and resilience about, uh, about myself, but that's really, really helping. So identify those qualities you like about yourself and that are supporting you through these challenging times because we all have got through it in, in one shape or form. There are things that have got us through it and there are things that have motivated us to keep going. Reframe those negative thoughts. I'm doing a whole webinar tomorrow around self-compassion um, with a team at the university. And it is all about reframing those negative thoughts. We very much think, oh gosh, it's ha this has happened. This is never, I'm never gonna get that sorted. Try and reframe it and put it into a more positive statement. Um, and that, that works really well. I always have a few questions at the back of my journal to challenge myself if ever I have a negative thought. So what is the evidence for that? Why are you thinking that way? Those are always some good tips for me. Listen to your body as well. Um, if you've got a banging headache, move away from the screen. Don't like I used to do, soldier on and keep and keep going. It's, it's not gonna help you. If you feel quite um, lethargic, move away from the screen, get out, go for a walk, get some fresh air. Eat well and mindfully. So the eating well, I know we can all struggle and sometimes it's very, very easy to just quickly grab something and eat during a meeting or eat whilst we're sat at the laptop. But I'm trying to be exceptionally strict with myself now and move away from the laptop in order to sort of eat properly and more mindfully. Every Mind Matters, this is a really, really good tool that I'd really like everybody to, um, to visit if they can and, and the links there. Um, it's part of the mental health and productivity pilot. It's one of the mental health initiatives that we're, um, we're promoting through the pilot. Um, it's a very quick five questions. You, you go onto the website, answer five quick questions about yourself, about your sleep, about your well-being, and put an email in that you don't um, that you would like the information sent to. And it sends you um, a mind map of tools, resources, and various top tips, etc. Um, it really does help deal with stress, boosts your mood. And actually, there's been a new um, hub of information put on there now on the back of COVID and indeed supporting you, any young people that you may be sort of carers or parents to. 
that's one really good tool. We've mentioned the mental health and productivity pilot. Any businesses that are really wanting to support their well, the well-being of their workforce, please do visit the MHPP website. There's um, a self-assessment there that you can have a look at all the different things. So what Femid has mentioned, um, we've also got lots of mental health issues that we can work with you on in terms of um, meeting the requirements around the mental health at work commitment. There's the Thrive at Work accreditation, a whole host of information there um, that if as a business, you really do want to take it seriously and really support the wellbeing of your workforce, please do visit that website. I've put a whole host of apps there as well, ones that I've found helpful, ones that um, the website Mind have, have recommended as well. A lot of these are free, um, always useful to have um, if you like working with your phone quite a bit. Your local mental health services, Mind and your GP should always be a really good first port of call. I know Holly's popped a few links in terms of crisis services as well in the, in the chat. And community groups, there's a massive, massive push now towards social prescribing, which basically means finding um, services or support within the community um, that, that can help, that can help and reassure and motivate and help sort of tap into any of that loneliness, isolation, anything that you may well be feeling. My concern is that mental health services are going to be inundated even more so than they already were. And so any of these um, apps, community groups, sort of your GP, any of the mental health and productivity pilots, anything you can get involved in that can support yourself, the Every My Matters tool, that's a really good one to do and not to wait till you're struggling, but to practice these things regularly. Those are my details, but I am just going to hand over to my lovely colleague, Louise, who is going to tell you a little bit more about managing minds, which is just another way of um, supporting your mental health and wellbeing. Louise. Great, thanks so much, Kate. So just, uh, I'm gonna give you a very quick overview of this other project that we're doing as part of the Mental Health and Productivity Pilots. And uh, this is uh, particularly focusing on the role of line managers in, in managing and trying to prevent mental health problems occurring in the workplace. Uh, and um, all our speakers, I think, have mentioned the importance of the role of line managers. And we're in the process at the moment of de designing an online learning a course for line managers which includes five modules which are in those boxes on the left hand side so the first one is, is, is on self-care then around um, management competencies to try and prevent stress designing work to promote positive well-being in the workplace creating psychologically safe workplaces and then the final module is on having conversations about mental health so um, each of these modules is designed to take about 20 to 30 minutes for line managers to, to complete. Um, we encourage, we're gonna be encouraging them to complete them over a six week period. Um, and the aim is really to increase line managers' confidence, their knowledge and their awareness about their role um, and, and increasing their skills in trying to develop a positive work environment um, that that's, promotes good mental well-being and prevents poor mental well-being. There's lots of interactivity in the in the modules and we're currently working with um, a, a wide group of stakeholders to, to finalise um, these modules. So this is just really to raise your awareness that this project's kind of ju just going on at the moment. We're going to be offering um, organisations to take part and have a go at the um, at signing up line managers to complete the training that's likely to start kind of around june july time so if you think that this might be in, of interest to your organization um, you can get in touch with us if you just go to the next slide please kate um, you can get in touch with um, um, myself or craig bartle dr craig bartle is on the call as well he's our lead researcher on this particular project so if you think this might be of interest and you want to find out a little bit more, we're very happy to set up a, a meeting with you to discuss in a bit more detail, but just really wanted to flag that as another opportunity that the mental health and productivity pilots uh, are, are kind of offering over the next 12 months or so. OK, that's that's all from me. So I think we're going back to Kate or to Sally. 
I think Kate's put herself on mute, so she's obviously. Come back. I was just flitting between screens, Sally. I'm here. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. Thank you both so much. And again, just um, uh, having been the line manager in a position where you know people have come to me and said, "I need help," and I felt totally ill-equipped and underconfident. I, Louise mentioned the stakeholders there having a play with this, um, with the, the, the line managers training. I wish I'd have had it back then. I think I, I've probably learned the long and hard way, which is by playing about unintentionally um, and, and kind of through trial and error. So I think that'll be a really, really useful resource. And again, as Louise said, um, you can get in touch with us. We'll, we'll put all contact details down in the chat. Um, and again, Kate, you're absolutely spot on. You know, I am, even if I do say so myself, I'm a great friend, but not to myself. You know, I will be the first one who will do something else rather than go to the gym. So I, I need to pull my finger out really although I did brush my hair and put trainers on today uh which is a which is progress from the hair tied back and the slippers um which I've been wearing since whenever we went into the first lockdown um I embarrassed myself okay so we're going to knit in to um the chat rooms I noticed though that um I think it was Liz had a question I'm going to throw an idea for you Liz just from my own practical experience but maybe when we go into the chat rooms other people will have different ideas so Liz's question was how can we ensure there's a perception of fairness across diverse teams I've been working recently with an organization um, that have a um, probably about six or seven different sort of contractors and you know um, home workers and workers that come into the office and workers that are then on the shop floor and um, so one of the first things we did Liz was we um we got a group with a rep or two from all of those different um parts of the organization so that we had a shared language and that we really understood but that they those different sort of elements then all knew that they'd got a voice at the table and that definitely helped in terms of not just it, you know, fair, everybody has the same, but actually then they could go back as advocates for the group as a whole and say, well, we've got this, but they've got that because, you know, they're working from home, so they need something slightly different. So, so that definitely worked. Um, and again, we can follow on that conversation um, if that's of use. So we're going to go into the breakout rooms now, um, just for five minutes or so, if Holly hasn't gone to sleep. Um, I'm sure she won't have done, she's way too professional for that. Um, and I'm going to ask you to share within your group, what one thing are you going to do differently for you and your workplace as a result of the session uh, that you've been taking part in this afternoon. So you've spent 90 minutes um, thinking about this. You're clearly um, wanting to make an improvement, make a positive impact. So what's the one thing you're going to do differently um, as you move forward? And as I say, probably about five minutes or so before Holly pulls us all back in the room to um, to uh, round things off. So Holly, if you wouldn't mind putting everybody back, please, into their breakout rooms, thanks. Yeah. I, I think, again, just a big high five to everybody on the call. You, like us, want to make a positive difference. And I know I said it at the very beginning, but really being part of that cutting edge research is the way to shape the future. My nan used to say to me, you can't change the whole world, but you can change the bit that you stand in. So get change in it. Um, so my plea to you is follow the links, do a bit more research, ring us, tweet us, join us on LinkedIn, whatever it is you want, we'll help you access um, the support, uh, we'll signpost you to whatever else um, it is that you need. Hopefully you've enjoyed having access to, you know, two such amazing colleagues with their, um, uh, you know, cutting edge research. They know 
their stuff and I'm so grateful to all of you on a on an academic and um, a practical level for sharing some of those insights with us I really do hope all of you will go away and do at least one thing if you haven't come up with what that one thing might be Holly's just put a link to a previous session we did on healthy body healthy business um, so you could sit back have a cup of tea and watch that um, and I just hope fingers crossed that after today's session we've got something slightly more interesting to look forward to as we return to the workplace than the mouldy mugs um, that I first thought of. <laughs>